Yes, it's my favourite time of the day again. It's Talking Pints, and I'm joined by... Well, I think friend and adversary, Sir Alan <laughs> That's Duncan. That's a fair description. <laughs> very, very Cheers. good to see you. Cheers. I've been trying to get a pint off you for years. Well, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> now, I say friend and adversary because I do remember one time we were doing Question Time, and it was in Yorkshire at an old bomber command base. Do you remember mm. this? Right. And the Take green room, the green room was like a sort of rear gunner's room. <laughs> and there was that game where you put 50p in and you were the rear gunner firing at Messerschmitts and things. I remember you and I playing that game and <laughs> the producers of Question Time getting very worried What's about going on here? where What's we going were on? and all that. <laughs> and now we're supposed to be bitter enemies, but of course we're not. We're civilised human beings. Yeah, exactly. And that's really important. And I'm really interested, before politics, you know, I was in the commodities business, London Metal Exchange. You were an oil trader. Yeah. Did you ever think we'd see a time when we'd start talking across Europe about energy rationing, about maybe even the lights going out? No, never. You wouldn't have thought that because when I started oil trading, it was the beginning of the free market in oil. And, of course, we've still got it. But I don't think anyone thought that there would be such a, a sort of... Uh, uh, strangling of pipelines of gas, which is the main problem we've got at the moment, um, caused by war on the edge of Europe, which we thought that we'd seen an end to. We so, always think that after every war, don't we? That's the danger, of course. <laughs> and, you know, wise people who say that, you know, history won't repeat itself need to realise that certain traits and themes never go away, and one of those themes is, is, is danger. And you have to have a defence system and be cautious and not just think that you're forever going to be OK. No, we're not. Well, I have to say, I think, you know, closing down the rough gas storage facility on the East Coast was one of the most short-sighted things any British government has ever done. Well, I think that's right. And I think it, it shows a very big theme of our politics over the last 25 years, which is something I feel very strongly about, which is politicians uh, do a lot of things for effect uh, and their policies are ill thought through and they think short-term, uh, because long-term decisions and long-term planning is not short-term popular. Because the, elect the election's in two years or three years or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah, or you, yeah, you don't think 25 years ahead on, on storage, infrastructure, uh, even, you know, sort of um, funding care and pensions and things. We're too yeah, short-term. I do remember this. Tony Blair asked Frank Field to go away and think the unthinkable, and Frank Field did, and Blair promptly sacked him. I mean, sacked him. I mean, I mean, Sorry. I mean, I mean, you're allowed was... to think it. You're not allowed to say it. <laughs> and were you one of those people who sort of had made his money before going into politics? Uh, not as much as some people think, but uh, enough and a bit. Uh, but I think the more important than the money is what, for me, was geopolitical experience. Mm -hmm. And I'd lived abroad as a youngster because my father was in the RAF. Uh, I lived abroad. I, I went to America for, for a bit as a, a university. And I just think that international experience and that feeling of other countries' attitudes and things is something that's been lost. And, of course, I mean, I think I'm right in saying that Boris Johnson's first cabinet was the first cabinet in British political history when no one was over 60. Mm. And so, mm. and then Nadine Doris came in, she was a bit older. Mm. And so, you know, where is the experience? It's not that you have to have age to have wisdom, but without some age, you're probably well, missing a lot well, of wisdom. I, I think you say point. age, but life experience, life experience is actually pretty important. I think and, so. you know, you've, I mean, 92, you first went to the Commons. Yeah. You've seen... The House of Commons changed incredibly during those years. I mean, the number of people who now come straight from uni yeah. th through a research office into the Commons doesn't make it a better place, does it? I think there's a real lack of lifetime experience. Yeah. It is a lot younger. Um, and I think there's also been another phenomenon which plays into that, which is that uh, government is very much uh, influenced by special advisers. So in all my time as a minister, it just felt the special advisers had more power, more yeah. access and more influence than ministers. And again, yeah. I don't think any prime minister in the last 15, 20 years has sat down with all of the health ministers, all of the treasury ministers. You know, if you're a CEO, you sit down with the finance team, you sit down with the marketing team. This doesn't happen in government. Amazing. So they never sit no, down no, with the ministers about their job, and I they're know, the ones who are supposed to be running the country. No, I, mean, I, used to, I, I used to tease the European Parliament. You've never done a proper job in your lives. God, they hated it. But we'll come, <laughs> but we'll come back to Europe in a minute. So a long time in the House of Commons. 27 years, yeah. yeah. And you look back on that. On balance, was it worth doing? Yeah, it's been costly. I mean, I think I gave up a lot. But 
you know what, I wouldn't have done anything else. And if, you know, I could have made a lot of money instead, but then I'd been frustrated that I hadn't done this. So yes. there's no point yes. in pretending that it wasn't the right thing. And, and, a, lo and a lovely constituency. Fantastic constituency Rutland. where I, Rutland, the little county, as yeah. William Hague said, it, it's amazing that the smallest member represents the smallest <laughs> county. <laughs> <laughs> and Rutland, of course, famously got its own independence from Leicestershire, didn't it? We got it back in yes. 1996. Yes. Peter Walker and Ted Heath having taken it away in 1972 yeah. or three. Yeah. So it's a very proud county with its own unitary authority, and I, it's home, and I, I, I love it. Um, but, in, you know, in addition to having what I've always regarded as the best constituency, um, I, I had two fascinating ministerial jobs. I mean, I don't give a damn. I was never in the Cabinet, but I was Minister of International Development during oh. the Arab Spring and all that kind of stuff. I was foreign minister, not only a deputy to Boris, but also during all the Brexit stuff. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, we'll come to that. You come to that, <laughs> I bet you are, I bet you are. But also, you know, um, dealing with Argentina and opening up mm. you know, Central Asia like Uzbekistan. I mean, I, I, I really loved it. I had a fascinating time. And that's the only thing I miss, actually. You, I mean, right back to university when you were a liberal, when the Liberal Party was arguably quite liberal, which is now pretty illiberal, in my view. But you believe in small government, you believe in the individual being able to live their lives. You are a libertarian. Yeah, in many I wasn't senses. a member of the Liberal Party. OK, but you were a liberal. I, I was when I was about 12. But OK. I, as, as I keep well, on saying. Well, rather like Liz Truss. Yeah, yeah, as I say, I grew out of it. <laughs> but you've always believed in that. You believe in the individual, yes. you believe in free markets, yeah. you believe in enterprise, you're socially incredibly relaxed about the world, and you hate authoritarianism yep. and big government. I can't work out, Alan Duncan, why you were a Remainer. Surely the European Union, the monolith in Brussels, the unelected bureaucracy running Europe, surely you should have been against that. No, I get that, uh, and uh, that, you know I was very much on the edge. Um, well, I don't know about that. You were pretty angry about it all. I mean, I... well, I became so because I became very worried about actually, uh, as a free marketeer, the loss of uh, absolute, total, easy free market access, um, and uh, I think that has cost us a bit because we we haven't got that in the way. We now have tariffs and things like that. Um, we don't have tariffs as such, but we have... Yeah, we, we have blockages, yes, let's call it, it. It's easy to trade with the rest of the world, but it's harder to trade with Europe, of course. That's yes, true. which is, our, I think, our closest and biggest market. So I, I think that's been a negative. Um, I, I, you're totally right about the, the fact, that, and I got angry about this too, that having been a good economic concept with uh, a layer of political co it cooperation, changed. it became a European government. Yeah. And I totally agree with you yeah. on that. You know, it's quite power light. I actually voted to leave. It's the first vote I ever cast in my life mm. in the 1975 referendum. Yeah, I know. And then I voted to remain because I was worried about the longer term consequences of international disruption because we become so interdependent. Uh, and I also thought that a lot of the, you know, the regulations and things which people blame on Europe were actually made 10 times worse by us because we gold plated, we turned uh, a recommendation or instruction from Europe. That may well be true. It's a very, very detailed but, but, law which was bossy. But I saw you the morning after the referendum on College Green. You were not a happy buddy, were you? No, because I thought um, it was going to... First of all, I thought it was, it was very divisive of the country. I don't believe in referendums altogether. Oh, it, what, it, what, is even it, how dare the little peasantry have their say? No, is that what you not, mean? No, not little peasantry at all. Quite the opposite. So if we'd left it to the MPs, I just we, think we'd singular... never have left the European Union, and no. yet the country wanted to. Isn't that an argument for direct democracy? They, they just wanted... Yeah, there are arguments for direct yeah. democracy, but I, I worry about referenda uh, because I think they sit ill with a parliamentary thing. I think there was one very, very big mistake which is that the results were allowed to be broken down into a constituency. If you're going to have a national referendum, you should have one national result. And that would have made life a lot more harmonious, wouldn't it? I think it would, because I, I think that, that saying this constituency was yeah. remain, this constituency yeah. would leave, when it was all on a knife edge anyway, and, you know, a, 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 some had a majority, of course, but others were very, very evenly split, yeah. was mass and remains massively divisive. Have you and I think it? that was a mistake. Are you over it? Oh, totally. I was over it the next day in the sense that I think, mm. at my view... Not what I saw. <laughs> <laughs> I was over it in the sense of accepting it, not yeah. necessarily being happy Weren't with it. Were you really angry that morning because you felt Boris hadn't been quite straight with people? 
I think... And you have an antipathy towards Boris, don't you? No. I, I, funny enough, I, 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 I've always made this very clear. I, 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 you know, ever since I left the Foreign Office, I've never said a word against Boris. I found him exasperating. <laughs> That's the issue. It's not that it's not that I didn't like him. I mean, I said to him, Boris, the trouble with you is 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 you are impossible to dislike, but sometimes you're very difficult to respect because I, I, I can't I make you serious? And what do you mean I, I'm, I'm not serious? And I said, well, look in the mirror. And, you know, and um, that you see, he's got a brilliant mind. Mm. He's also got a rather untidy mind. Mm. And my lament, you know, my book is a sort of lament about the decline of our standing in the world and the standards in Parliament, was that Boris didn't apply himself to the job of Prime Minister once he'd got there. And I actually think that no other leader I've worked with could have been as effective in the pandemic as him. Because okay. it needed his, his character to galvanise public opinion in this unique once-in-a-century episode. And he did that. I actually think that he would be brilliant in doing the same for our economic plight now, had he not, sadly, yeah, blown, it. blown it, shot himself in the foot. So, so my, my, my opinions about him are, are, are not those of disapproval and dislike. They are those of no. upset well, and, and, and exasperation. And let's see what Liz Truss does. And she might yet surprise us, I think. Let's we'll see. On, we on, have to hope so. On that optimistic note, I'll <laughs> say thank you for joining me on Talking Pipes. Cheers. Well, cheers.